It's you! You're actually watching me? You're watching me? Dang. I didn't think that was possible. I really did not think that that was possible. Wow. You're watching me. This is so cool. Oh my goodness. How is this possible? I need to, I need to keep down my voice because it's in the middle of the night. It is... It is 12.25 a.m. I didn't do that right, but it is 12.25 AM. So why are you watching this video? What have you done? Why have you come to me? What are you doing here? I'll tell you. I'll tell you... Right now, I will tell you. You are here because you clicked on this video. And you clicked on this video because the thumbnail was pretty interesting and and I came here to see you I came here to see you and tell you that I appreciate you I appreciate you and I'm gonna read a book for you just because you came okay it's called Moby Dick it's my favorite book we're gonna start page one. We'll go to page. I need a. There's a lot of references in the back. I gotta count. Okay, to page 469. That's what page we're going to. Okay. I'm gonna skip some of the extracts. Don't don't leave, okay? Cause this is really important, and I have to tell it to you, okay? I have to, and you have to listen to me, because you clicked on this video, you can't just click away, okay? You can't. Chapter 1. Loomings. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see a watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the month, whenever it's damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear every few I meet, I Especially, and especially whenever my hypos get an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off then I account in high time to get to the sea as soon as I can. We're still in chapter one guys. Isn't this so cool? This is my substitute for pistol and ball. Dang, he would have killed himself with a philosophical, with a philosophical flourish. Cato throws himself upon his sword, like like this story, right? With Cato, you know that story. I quickly take to the ship. There is nothing surprising in this. See, he would have he would have killed himself if he didn't. If he didn't go to the ship. This is my commentary, by the way. This, I've read this before. I haven't gotten through the whole thing, no. But, anyways. There's nothing surprising in this. If they but knew it, almost all men in their degree, sometime or another, sometime or other, cherish very nearly the same feelings toward the ocean with me. You see? You probably do, too. You probably like the ocean. The whales? Oh, too bad this book's about killing whales. So there's that. I don't know why I'm waiting. I'm just, I'm just reading. I'm trying to find my spot because I just waste. Okay, there we go. Now there is your insular city of the Manhattos. That means Manhattan, by the way. 
belted round by wharves as Indian Island, by coral reefs. Commerce surrounds it with her surf. Right and left, the streets take you waterward. That's true. If you've been to Manhattan, lots of water. Its extreme downtown is the Battery, where that noble mole is washed by the waves and cooled by the breeze, breezes. And with a few hours precious, or out of sight of land, look at the crowds of water gazers there. Circum circumambulate the city of a dreamy Sabbath afternoon. That means Sunday. Go from Corlear's Hook to Cohen Tile Slip and from thence by Whitehall northward. northward. What do you see? Posted like silent sentinels around all the town stand thousands upon thousands of mortal men fixed in ocean reveries, some leaning against the spiles, some seated upon the pier heads, some looking over the bulwarks of ships from China, from China, some high aloft in the rigging as if striving to get a still better seaward step, seaward peep, I keep messing up, but these are all landsmen. A weekdays pent up in lath and plaster, tried, tied to counters, nailed to benches, clinked to desks. How then is this? Are the green fields gone? What do they do? What do they hear? What do they hear? But look, here come more crowds, pacing straight for the water and seemingly bound for a dive. Strange, nothing will content them but the extremest limit of the land, meaning the water, loitering under the shady lee of yonder warehouses, will not suffice. No, they must get as high, as nigh the water as they possibly can without falling in. And there they stand, miles of them leagues. Inlanders all come from the lanes and alleys, streets and avenues, north east, south, and west. Yet here they all unite. Tell me, how does the magnetic virtue of the needles of the compass tell all of those ships attract them thither? Once more, say you're in the country, in some high land of lakes. Take almost any path you please, and ten to one it carries you down in a dale and leaves you there by a pool in the stream. There is magic in it. Let the most absent-minded men of men be plunged in this deepest reverie. Stand that man on his legs, set his feet along a going, and he will infallibly lead you to water, if water there be in all that region. I don't know if that's true, but that's what he wrote. Should you ever be a thirst in the great American desert, try this experiment. If your caravan happened to be supplied with a metaphysical professor. Yes, as everyone knows, meditation and water are wedded forever. We're still in the first chapter, folks. Got a, got a couple more pages to the second chapter. And there's like 150. But here is an artist. He desires to paint to you the dreamiest, shadiest, quietest, most enchanting bit of romantic landscape in all the valley of the Sacco. What is the chief element he employs? There stand his trees, each with a hollow trunk. And there sleep, nope, as if a hermit in a crucifix were within. And here sleeps his meadow. And there sleep his cattle, and up from yonder cottage goes a sleepy smoke. Deep into the distant woodland winds, a mazy way reaching to the overlapping spurs and mountains bathed in their hillside blue. But through this picture lies thus tranced, and through this pine tree shakes down its sighs like leaves upon the shepherd's head. Yet all were vain 
unless the shepherd's eye were fixed upon the magic stream before him. Go visit the prairies in June. Then for scores on scores of miles, you wade knee deep, knee deep, among the tired Kiger lilies. What is the one charm wanting water? It's water. There's not a drop of water there. When I aggro about a cataract of sand, that means cataract means waterfall, if you didn't know that. If you didn't, I just wanted you to know that cataract meant waterfall. Would you travel your thousand miles to see it? No! Why did the, did the poor poet of Tennessee, upon suddenly receiving two handfuls of Sibler, deliberate whether to buy him a coat? which he badly needed to invest his money in a pedestrian trip to Rockaway Beach. Why is almost every robust healthy boy with a robust healthy soul in him at one time or another crazy to go to the sea? I know that's happened to me. I'm just kidding. Why upon your first voyage as a passenger did you find did you yourself feel such a mystical vibration which first told you that you and your ship were now out of sight of land? Why did the old Persians hold the sea holy? Why did the Greeks give it a separate deity? Surely all this is not without meaning. And it's still deeper the meaning of that story of Narcissus who became he could not grasp and because he could not grasp the tormenting, mild image he saw in the fountain plunged into it and was drowned. He was drowned. But that same image we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans. But that same... Yep, I already said that. Good catch. In the, It is the image of the ungraspable phantom of life and this is the key to it all now when I say I'm in the habit of going to see whenever I begin to grow hazy about the eyes and begin to be over the conscious of my lungs I do not mean to have it inferred that I ever go to sea as a passenger no 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 why would he go to sea as a passenger this is Moby Dick For to go as a passenger, you must needs have a purse. And a purse is but a rag unless you have something in it. Besides, passengers got seasick, get seasick, grow quarrelsome, don't sleep of nights, and do not enjoy themselves much as a general thing. No, I never go as a passenger, nor, though I am something of a salt, do I ever go to sea as a commodore or a captain. Or cook? Why would you want to do that? I abandon the glory and distinction of such offices to those who like them. For my part, I abominate all honorable, respectable toils, trials, and tribulations of every kind whatsoever. It's quite as much as I can to take care of myself without taking care of ships. Bark caves, maybe? I think that's how you, how you pronounce Breaks, schooners, and whatnot, and as for going as a cook, though I confess there is considerable glory in that, a cook being a sort of officer on shipboard, yet, however, I never fancied broiling fowls. Though once broiled, judicially buttered, and judgmatically salted and peppered, there is no one who will speak more respectfully. Not to say reverentially of a broiled fowl and I will. I need to sit up. I'm in the center of the frame, it's terrible. I'm getting tired. I'm getting very tired. 
but it's not yet time to stop reading. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read, but I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna rethink the whole reading the whole book because this is a little bit of a long book. Just a, just a, just a little bit long for for one video. I'm sure um, people have done it. I'm sure you could you could probably go and and listen to a, a YouTube video of, of somebody reading this book um, all the way through. But I don't I don't I don't think I have time. I haven't even read the book, so on to the next sentence. It is out of the idolatrous dotings of the old Egyptians upon borrowed ibis and roasted river horse that you see the mummies of those creatures in their huge big houses, the pyramids. No, when I go to sea, I go as a simple sailor right before the mast. Plumb down into the forecastle. The forecastle is um, a part of a boat. Loft there to the royal masthead. True, they rather order me about some. That's that makes sense. And make me jump from spar to spar like a grasshopper in a may somehow, a may meadow. And at first, this sort of thing is. Unpleasant enough, it touches one's sense of honor, particularly if you come from an old established family in the land, the Van Rensselaers, or the Randolphs, right? Or the Hardic Canutes. These are all, I guess, prominent people who existed back then. And more than all, I've just previous to putting your hand into the, the tar pot. You've been lording it as a country schoolmaster, making the tallest boys stand in awe of you. The transition is a keen one, I assure you, from the schoolmaster to a sailor, and requires a strong decoction of Seneca. I think that's a city in New York. I don't know. In the Stoics. Those are probably people that think about things. To enable you to grin and bear it. But even this wears off in time. What of it? And some old hunks of a sea captain orders me. If one orders me to get a broom and sweep down the decks, what does that indignity amount to? Weight, I mean, in the scales of the New Testament. Do you think the Archangel Gabriel thinks anything less of me because I promptly and respectfully obey that old hunks in that particular instance? Who ain't a slave? Tell me that. Well then, whatever the old sea captains... Onward with the book. I almost got you there. You thought I was gonna stop. I'm not gonna stop. Pacing straight. F oh, I skipped a page. No, I didn't. I went back a page. I'm sorry. Well then, whatever the old sea captains may order me about, whatever they may thump and punch me about, I have the satisfaction of knowing that it is all right. That everybody else is one way or other served in much the same way. Either in physical or metaphysical point of view, that is, and so the universal thump is passed around and all hands should rub each other's shoulder blades. 
and be content. Again, I always go to see as a sailor, cause they make a point of paying me for my trouble, whereas they never pay passengers a single penny that I ever heard of. On the contrary, passengers themselves must pay. And there's all the difference in the world between paying and being paid. The act of paying is perhaps the most uncomfortable infliction that the two ultra thieves entailed upon us. That's Adam and Eve, if you didn't know. Just but being paid. What? What'll compare with the Arab pain act? with which man receives money is really marvelous considering that we so earnestly believe money to be the root of all earthly evils earthly ills sorry and that on no count can a bond can a money man enter into heaven Ah, how cheerfully we consign ourselves to perdition. Finally, I always go to sea as a sailor because of the wholesome exercise and pure air of the forecastle deck. For as in this world, headwinds are far more prevalent than winds from a stern. A stern is the back part of the ship, if you didn't know that. That is, if you never violate the Pythagorean maxim. There's a little note here that I looked up when I read this. That I forgot what it means. But it's a maxim somewhere. So, for the most part, the Commodore on the quarter deck gets his atmosphere at second hand. from the sailors on the forecastle. Did you know that? He thinks he breathes at first. He thinks he does. But not so. In much the same way do the commonality lead their leaders in many other things at the same time that the leaders little suspect it. But wherefore it was that after having repeatedly smelt the sea as a merchant sailor, I should now take it into my head to go on a whaling voyage.